heat pumps, and air conditioning. So we learned that heat always flows from hot to cold, but using a heat pump, we can put energy into the system to make heat flow from cold to hot, like we can make heat flow out of the freezer and into the warm room. We should understand at any point in the system, heat only flows from hot to cold, but we can change the temperature by means of compressing a gas, because we know when we put work into, when we compress a gas, its temperature will increase. When we let a gas expand, it will cool. It's important to know that heat pumps are a very efficient way to heat a house because with one joule of energy, you can move many joules of heat from, let's say, the cold outside into your warm house. Let's review heat engines and talk about how heat pumps work. We understand for heat engines, heat likes to flow from hot to cold, like from the hot reactor to the cold ocean. We can make use of this by putting a turbine in between and getting work or generating electricity out of it. The hot heat turns into cold heat and work, and we conserve energy, and we also recognize there's a maximum efficiency we can attain, which is less than 100%, that depends on the differences in the temperatures. The greater the difference in temperature, the greater our theoretical efficiency can be. With a heat pump, we want to make heat flow from cold to hot. It doesn't work that way by itself, but it will if we put work or electricity into it. So for instance, if we wanted to heat our house in the winter, we could pump heat from the cold outside or from the cold lake by our house into our nice warm winter house. And so here what we're interested in is getting as much heat into the house as possible. For a refrigerator, we're more interested in getting rid of this cold heat from the freezer and pumping it out of the freezer, for instance, into our house. Again, we have to conserve energy. There is a maximum efficiency we can hope to achieve given the difference in temperatures between the hot and the cold. The larger the difference in temperatures, the lower our coefficient of performance because we have to push this heat against this temperature gradient. What's also interesting to note, this coefficient of performance can be much, much greater than one or 100%, meaning that with one joule of energy, we could move many joules of energy from the cold to the hot. In fact, we can see that as the difference in temperature between the hot and cold is zero, we would have an infinite coefficient of performance, meaning we could move an infinite amount of heat with no energy. Now this is a coefficient of performance for the heat pump, because what I want is my hot heat. My coefficient of performance for a refrigerator, what I want is to get rid of the cold heat. So I have a very similar coefficient of performance which is slightly less because we can see, of course, you're going to get more heat into the hot area than you're going to get from the cold area because you're adding in work that ultimately becomes heat, consistent with our conservation of energy. So in Wikipedia, we have a little diagram of how a refrigerator or a heat pump works, and it shows us moving heat into the hot area and moving cold into the cold area. Well, that doesn't really happen, of course. You're moving cold heat from a freezer into the coils, those back coils that are very cold in the back of your freezer, which is dissipated in the hot coils behind your refrigerator. How does this happen? You take a gas that is in these coils and you compress it. This work heats it up. You can then get rid of that extra heat through the back. You have air in the coils in the back of your freezer and you compress them, making them very hot. Now you can get rid of that heat by running them through the cooling coils in the back, although it's much hotter than the freezer. But now you have very compressed air and it's cool, and when you let it expand, it gets very cold, and then you run it back through the freezer, and it warms up by accepting heat from the freezer. In fact, what actually happens is you use a working fluid that evaporates and condenses, and so so the very compressed gas here actually condenses, and therefore you lose the whole heat of vaporization, which is an enormous amount of energy. And you end up with a liquid under high pressure. And then in this valve, what happens is that it evaporates, thereby the fluid absorbs the heat of vaporization, which of course is a huge amount of energy. As that gaseous fluid goes through the freezer, it gets heated up and then compressed again. Here's a more realistic drawing. This might be the coils in the back of your refrigerator. Of course, you can't see them in the new refrigerators. Look in a very old refrigerator in the freezer compartment sometime and you'll see them. These are the ones that people always puncture by accident 
with the screwdriver when they try to clean the ice off them, and they emit the chlorofluorocarbons into the air, destroying the refrigerator and harming the ozone. We have your compressor here, and your hot fluid goes out into the coils in the back. What's also interesting to know is that this pumps heat from this cold spot out here. If you change the direction of the fluid, you could turn the air conditioner or this cooler into a heater whereby you would pump heat the other way. It would require you to change these bypass valves and to make the compressor's output go into this coil with this reversing valve. I want you to examine these numbers and give it some time. This would be your air conditioner and you're trying to pump heat from your cool house out into the high temperature outdoors. And you could use this temperature difference to calculate your Carnot coefficient of performance. However, that's not the temperature difference that the machine feels. This is your air conditioner. It has to absorb heat at a lower temperature and give off heat at a higher temperature. Why? Because the cooling coils must be at a temperature lower than the house in order for heat to flow from the house to the coils. And the output temperature outside has to be hotter than the outdoor world in order for heat to flow from the coils outside. And we know that. If you touch the coils of the air conditioner, it's pretty cold, much colder than the room. And if you were to touch the cooling coils outside, they're much hotter than the outside world. So when you calculate the ideal coefficient of performance of these two temperatures, you get a smaller number. Your actual coefficient of performance is going to be smaller too because the machine itself is not perfect. So what you need to do is you don't need to minimize this temperature gap. You need to minimize this temperature gap by minimizing these two differences in temperature. Of course, this is the heat pump to cool your house. It has a corresponding freezer that you want to cool by heating the house, and you'd have all of these different labels. Thus, to reduce heat pump energy use, what you want to do is find ways to get heat to flow through these coils as efficiently as possible. Another way is to make use of a good energy sink or source, such as a thermal reservoir in the ground or in a pond or in your swimming pool. One very permaculture-esque way to do something is if you had a swimming pool, which probably wouldn't be very permaculture-esque to begin with, but you could heat the swimming pool in the summer by cooling the house. And so you'd simultaneously air condition your house and heat your swimming pool. In the process, you'd have a very high coefficient of performance for both processes. So optimizing the performance of heat pumps largely involves optimizing the performance of heat flow that are external to the heat pump itself. Okay, so how are we going to move heat? If you have a heat pump and you want to air condition some houses, for instance, in Poly Canyon Village, they have a cogen facility that generates electricity and heats water. This water is used to heat all the rooms. Well, how do they do that? They have hot water and they run it through pipes to the rooms. It's important to understand that you're going to have a lot of what you call parasitic losses in the pumping of this heating fluid. The electrical power used is going to be proportional to the cube of the flow rate. This is because power, we remember, is equal to a pressure term times a flow term. But because the, the pressure difference from one end of a pipe to the other is going to be proportional to the rate of flow squared for turbulent flow. There's also efficiency term in the, um, the efficiency of the pump. Radiant ceiling cooling is a very efficient way to cool a room. And in fact, in Poly Canyon Village, we use radiant ceiling heating. We can also use displacement ventilation, which is where the cool air comes in from up the bottom and moves upward. The important thing here is it turns out that if you want to move heat, you're much better off pumping hot water than hot air. You say water is very heavy, so it must cost a lot of energy to move it. And you say, yeah, but you move a huge amount of heat because first you have a density term, the density of water, and the specific heat of water, which is very, very high. If you're air conditioning air from the outside and bringing it into your house, you're expending a whole lot more energy in cooling that hot outside air than if you just recirculated your air inside the house and kept cooling the same air. In order to keep the air fresh inside your house, you're going to have to mix in some air from the outside, but you want this number to be low in order to save electricity.
So if you don't need for the air to be really cold, you can use a chiller, especially in dry areas. What's a chiller? Well, it just makes use of evaporative cooling. So you take some water and you spray it with little spraying ducts. You can see this at Cal Poly. There's a huge chilling facility. And through this sprayed air, you circulate this dry air from the outside. The evaporation process cools these pipes, and you run your water through these pipes to cool. And what you exhaust out is reasonably warm, humid air. You can use solar to heat water for domestic use, for space heating inside the house. You can also use the heat from the sun to dry out a desiccant, such as a salt crystal. Then when you run the air from the building over the same salt crystal, it will absorb the water from the air in the building. And this is a very inexpensive way to dehumidify your buildings. And when you build the building in the first place, ask yourself, which way is the sun? Where do we get shade from the trees? This consideration can lower your costs and also improve the environment for all workers or people who live there. I like this. As the sun heats up this stack, it causes the air to rise and it sucks air in from other areas and cools the building. You get a lot of cost savings with these considerations. One of the things to consider, if you make use of a lot of efficiency measures in the building, you can downsize the size of the air conditioner or the heater, or you might do away with it altogether. This saves a lot of money. So this is a consideration that Amory Levins of Rocky Mountain Institute talks about a lot. If you have your project costs graphed against increased efficiency measures, it would look like this. Because we know that, for instance, adding insulation to a building is much cheaper in the long run than heating the building. However, if you add more insulation, it'll have a less effect, and eventually, the extra insulation that you add, if you have a huge amount of insulation, that extra amount of insulation is going to cost more than the savings that you get from the reduced energy bill. And so here, your efficiency measures are no longer helping you until you add a little bit more because at some point, you no longer need an air conditioner or a heater because your building is so well insulated. So there you go. Please know the difference between a heat engine and a heat pump and how to make them efficient.